there isn't anything you can do that can excuse, condone, justify any form of violence against your body. Nothing. Welcome to the Black Girl Mystic Podcast Portal, your weekly gathering of Black women and femme spiritual leaders, teachers, healers, and medicine folk from across the African diaspora. I'm your host and guide, Laren Alta, medicine woman, teacher, healer, and mystic. My intention is to create a sacred and sovereign container for you to more deeply explore yourself and your divinity so that you can tap into your spiritual gifts and live your soul's purpose. Sound good? Excellent. Let's do this. You're invited to support the Black Girl Mystic podcast portal so that we can keep our lights on and continue bringing you all of the powerful conversations with Black women and femme, spiritual teachers, healers, lightworkers, shadow workers, mystics, and more. So there are a few ways that you can support the work of Black Girl Mystic. Number one, you can make a monthly contribution and join the Inner Circle community on Patreon. Memberships start at just $1 a month. When you're a Black Girl Mystic patron, you get behind-the-scenes conversations, extended interviews, book club discussions, discounts on courses, and offerings not available anywhere else. Sign up to be a monthly Black Girl Mystic sponsor at patreon.com slash blackgirlmystic. If a one-time contribution is more your speed, that's completely welcome too. You can make your contribution at paypal.me slash blackgirlmystic. One of the most powerful ways to support Black Girl Mystic Podcast Portal is by spreading the word. Tell your girlfriends, sister friends, good Judies, and anyone else that you think would enjoy these powerful conversations that we have on the Black Girl Mystic podcast. And last, but not least, you can subscribe and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Your rating makes it easier for folks to find us so that they can connect to the Black Girl Mystic magic as well. Thanks for being here, my love, and contributing to the Black Girl Mystic podcast portal. Peace and greetings, loved ones. Welcome to the 28th gathering of the Black Girl Mystic Podcast Portal. Thank you for being here. Whether this is our first time together or you have been on this journey for all of these gatherings, I am delighted and deeply honored by your presence. I hope that you are being deeply nourished and fed in ways that you may not even recognize yet. So I just want to thank you for being here because this is a labor of love, of medicine, of joy, of peace, of power, ancestral guidance, intuitive wisdom, and just my heart's desire. So thank you again for being here. I am deeply honored. And I'm thrilled to share my conversation with Aisha Shahida Simmons. Aisha Shahida Simmons' award-winning cultural work expresses its voice through the art of documentary filmmaking, writing, teaching, public speaking, and activism. Her work is informed by her lived experiences as a Black feminist lesbian, a child sexual abuse survivor, an adult rape survivor, and a Buddhist practitioner. She is the producer and director of the 2006 groundbreaking acclaimed film, No, the Rape Documentary, and the organizer of the 2020 Lambda Literary Award-winning anthology, Love with Accountability, Digging Up the Roots of Child Sexual Abuse. The anthology emerges from Aisha's Love with Accountability project. 
In December 2020, Aisha was named one of 19 2020 Soros Justice Fellows, and she is presently working on the third part of a three survivor-centered cultural works that seeks to disrupt and end childhood sexual abuse and adult rape in Black communities. Aisha is also in a two-year training to be a certified mindfulness meditation teacher. This contemplative work is a continuation of her 18-year Buddhist practice. This is a powerful conversation and trigger warning, as you might have gleaned from her bio. We do mention child sexual abuse and adult rape, although no details are shared. So you just might want to be prepared for that topic as you're going into listening. It's a deeply loving, powerfully compassionate and transformative conversation. I love it so much because so often, globally, women and girls and femmes are taught to be silenced around their pain, around their trauma, around what they have survived. And I love that Aisha has made medicine and continues to make medicine based on her life path, her gifts, her experiences, and her own healing journey work. This is an unparalleled conversation, and I'm so excited to share it with you. Introducing Aisha Shahida Simmons. Aisha Shahida Simmons, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Black Girl Mystic Podcast Portal. I am so delighted and excited to have you here and deeply honored, actually. It's, it feels like such a gift to have you. You've been such a forebearer and light bearer for me on this path of spirituality, on this path of like really following your soul. And I love having you in this deep conversation with me. So thank you for being here. So before we dive in deep into the container, I want to call in or hold space for any elders, ancestors, energy that you would like to be part of today's today's conversation. So I would I, I would like to name Tony K. Bambara, who was my teacher and big sister friend. I would like to name my pater- maternal great aunt Jessie Neal Hudson. And um, my mat- maternal great grandmother, Rhoda Bell Douglas, and my grandmother's maternal and paternal, Rebecca White Simmons Chapman, and Juanita Watson, and Audrey Lord, who I did not know, I didn't get to meet in person, but she profoundly influenced my life. And I had the opportunity to go to St. Croix and spend time with her, our partner, Dr. Gloria Joseph. Mm, Ashe, welcoming all of them in. Thank you. Uh, and we know, and we're going to dive deep into this conversation about Buddhist practice that you have been on this path for decades. We're going to dive into filmmaking and your writings, all of this. But before we go there, I want to know what Aisha was like as a little one. Tell us about little Aisha. Wow. <laughs> well, I feel like there uh, two. There's like pre ten and post ten. So I I think at like little Aisha. I, in fact, I shared um, my mother recently shared a photo of me. I was raised in a, a Sufi Muslim community. My mother's teacher was from Sri Lanka. So I always looking back on it now. I mean, I think I was always kind of like sister outsider. I mean, I'm I'm gonna I'm fifty two or soon to be fifty two years old, and so a name Aisha Shahida is, you know, it's pretty okay, common now in 2021, but I was born in 69. It was not common. I was a vegan, raised vegan. Um, and so I, and very curious, everybody, when I talk to the elders who are in my life now, still who knew me when I was a child, they always talk about me being very curious about life, always asking questions, trying to piece things together. And I still do that. In fact, I came across a, a, a report card from uh, when I was in the fourth grade and the teacher was just writing, teacher Karen was her name. She um, talked about my inquisitive nature as well as like always trying to work things out, make sure that, you know, things were okay between my friends and I, and then I would be worried about it to the point where she was like, I think she worried too much. And I was like, oh my God, I still do that. <laughs> <laughs> I had, I just came across that report card and I was like, oh, Wow, this is like who I am. This is <laughs> Isn't it affirming to get that resonance like, oh, I have been me my whole life. Right. <laughs> 
Oh, I love that. I love that. And I love knowing that you were raised in a Sufi family with your a Sri Lankan uh, teacher. Your mother's teacher was Sri Lankan because that we're going to go there in a, in a minute talking about the Southeast Asian influence of your spiritual journey. Um, so it's yeah. so powerful to know that this is part of your spiritual roots as well. It really is. I mean, as an African-American, I definitely, and, and because my family, my my grandparents, my aunt, they were all Christian. So, and, you know, and ate, and, and ate meat and ate pork and went to church, all of that. And so, you know, there's AME and Baptist all surrounding me. Um, And I love like there's certain foods in terms of I would sneak or, you know, my grandmother, you know, and eat macaroni and cheese even. I was supposed to be a vegan as a child and, you know, greens and stuff like that. But, you know, a lot of home cooking for me is South Asian food. And it's always an interesting thing, you know, really always wanting to be mindful and aware about like, you know, not to say, I mean, I think it's fine because we live in this country, the U.S., where we all have different tastes of food because there, there isn't really one type of uh, U.S. based food, so to speak, at least that I don't subscribe to. But I love and make and grew up on curries, you know, South Asian food, dal and rice and kitchery, all these kinds of stuff. And so and that's like that's home cooking for me. Oh, I I'm like, I want some now. I'm like, I want some dal <laughs> and curry. I'm hungry. <laughs> I love that. And I also love that you named Baptist and AME influences, right? I grew up AME from birth until I kind of evolved out of religious structure in that way. But it was so influential. So how did you, as a young person, or did you hold the AME, the Baptist, and the Muslim faith? Did they harmonize or did you feel kind of like they were separate? No, they didn't harmonize at all. I would say that it was around me, but I, I really, I didn't know what was going on because I also went to Quaker schools and camps. So I, you know, like it was, I feel like I'm one of those kind of, um, you know, like 70 here. I mean, I was born in 69, the last of the, you know, the sixties, but I'm really one of those kind of, you know, black, I was, uh, you know, my, my parents were very much in, in black power and, uh, movements, and then also in terms of the spiritual, uh, non-Christian spiritual, and then my mother's community it was multiracial. So it was, it was a lot. And I think my grandparents just didn't know what was going on because my mother, one thing she didn't play was about pork. So like you could not, I, she didn't want me eating in pots that were cooked with, where pork was cooked. And of course, that can be now looking back on, you know, can I can see how it could hurt, you know, um, her her family. And so I remember when my father's mother was much more close to because I was raised in Philly and she lived in Philly. Um, You know, she would have the pots for Aisha with the string, you know, all the, the food without the meat, all of that. So and she wasn't she was spiritual, but she wasn't a heavily religious person. Her sister, my aunt Liz Patterson, and um, her her niece, my who I call, who's a cousin, but I called Aunt Margaret Palmer. Like I would go to church with them, but it was church was an important part of their lives. But it wasn't like it didn't define everything. As opposed to with my mother's family, who I wasn't as close to because I didn't see them as much in Memphis, Tennessee. It was their lives. So I don't. So I remember one time when I went to Memphis. My mom was at a conference in Mexico and she sent me to Memphis because there was a three mile island scare around. A, there was a fear of a nuclear like spill. And, Whoa. And, and it's very close, relatively speaking, in ter- particularly in terms of nuclear waste in, ter- in, in Philly. So she shipped me off to Memphis and it was during Easter or something like it was around that time. And and I remember telling my great grandmother, who was born in 1898, Ray, her, her grandmother was a descendant now was was enslaved and was a descendant of rape. And so, you know, just in terms of just that trajectory. So granny, I remember she was like, oh, you know, we got to get ready for Easter. And, you know, and I was like, granny, what's Easter? Oh, my God. <laughs> she was like, what? <laughs> so it was like this whole big 
think I don't even I guess my mom, I, you know, I, you know, thinking about phones and stuff. I don't know how she called from Mexico or whatever, because, again, this was 79, not 21. Um, she you know, my grandmother gave her a good tongue lashing and I had to learn what it was. But I remember liking Easter and liking I associated Christianity with getting my hair straightened because I got my hair straightened. I had Shirley Temple curls and then I got to per, uh, play in a, um, participate in a play at church which looking back on it really wasn't fair to all the kids who were there and who'd been there because I got a speaking role. And I think that was looking back on it, a way to try to get me to bring me into Christ, right? It's really not fair to the (laughs) the kids who were in church all the time. So then I was like, so I, but I really was like, I like being a Christian. I get to have my hair straightened. I can have (laughs) children. I can speak at the church because there wasn't like really a, a children's program at, in the community at the time that I was there, a child at the in the community where I went. So I was just always uh, where my mother, um, where I was raised, was always just kind of there. So I really liked it. I, and I liked the sense of community and without really, you know, I think having a racial analysis, I liked being around all these black kids, even though they were just like, your name is funny and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I love this image of you in Memphis, Tennessee with Shirley Temple curls in a speaking part at the Easter program. That is lighting up my heart so much. I love it. Oh, that is so beautiful. It's And it's beautiful just like in this context of the landscape that you're painting, right? Coming from Philly, having, I just love the dive. Well, really, it's a curry. It's a curry. Your whole like spiritual upbringing has all of these different flavors. Yeah. So then how do you go from having these different influences and flavors to kind of charting your own spiritual path, finding your own way forward? What was that first exploration for you? Well, I no longer wanted, my mother was was a founding member of the Baal Mahayadeen Fellowship. um, And I didn't want to go anymore. And so my mom was like, you have to do something. Like I had to do something. So then I started because as I said, I went to Quaker school from first through fourth grade and then camp for three years during my tweens. So, and my parents worked at the American Friends Service Committee. So Quakers have always been a part of my life. So I started going to meeting for worship, which is silent meeting in, in, you know, there are different types of Quakers. And so Aisha, how old were you around this time? I guess I was in my, I was in my teens. I think I was in my teens and I started doing, going to Quaker meeting. I also started going to Overeaters Anonymous um, because we were talking about spiritual practice, but in the midst of all this, I am, I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and also young adult rape. And so I was molested by um, my grandfather for two years and so I think, you know, for me, coping and uh, my just different types, and I have a d- different understanding, uh, I think, around food addiction for myself. But at the time, it was just kind of like, I just, I think I was looking for community and OA was just, Overeaters Anonymous was, and again, it was in my teen years, was just this place where I found community in this interesting way. I was like, because I was really, I mean, I was young in comparison to the there weren't many young people in, 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 at the meetings, it was all predominantly women. And so I really enjoyed like when we would have the serenity prayer and the sharing. So there was something powerful about that. And then meeting for worship, which was really, you know, I mean, for me, I now view it as a silent meditation, but it was just, you know, you sit in, in a meditative silence and when, if the spirit moves you, you stand and speak in meeting for worship. So I started doing that. And so that spoke to me. And then in my, when I came out as a lesbian in 1990, my partner at the time, um, she was raised Muslim and so, and didn't see any contradiction between her Muslim identity and her queer identity, black woman, African-American woman. And so that was really powerful for me. Um, and she was older than, I mean, I, I was 21 and she was 30, she was nine years older than I, and she is still. And, and then she also had alter. And I was like, well, you don't have, you don't do altar. Not with Sunni Islam. You don't do, no, no, no. And then she was like burning sage. So she was like doing all this stuff that I, and I think that, and I'm grateful that she was Muslim because I don't know, had she been any other denomination, if I would have been open to an altar, to any of that. Cause I would have been like, no, no, you don't do that. And she said, yes, you can. You can do that and be a Muslim. And so that was really <laughs> powerful. Um, really, really 
um, powerful. So then I think I was just kind of you know, moved into a lesbian feminist collective. I was, you know, it was predominantly white household. There was um, there was a, another black woman in, in the household and, you know, doing just kind of like doing Wiccan and, you know, feminist lesbian stuff. So just trying to, I was just kind of feeling my way, <laughs> really feeling my way along the way. And then I got connected with queer Muslims. There was an organization called Al Fatiha, which is an LGBTQIA queer Muslim organization that was international and really connected there. And that was very powerful in terms of connecting with queer, out queer folks, you know, South Asian, mm. house you know, just wide range and going, went to a couple of um, conferences, meetings and, and prayers. So that was meaningful, but it, it wasn't home yet for me, even like it, it was something, it was like, yes, I know this. And then I, you know, checked out some black queer churches and appreciated that, but that didn't work for me. And then I, my, I helped transition. I was there when my mother, my grandmother, I mean, I was five hours. I left five hours before she became an ancestor. But I was there the last three days of my grandmother's life and had such a profound, I never told her what her husband, who's my step-grandfather, did to me as a child. And so she was not conscious, but I shared like about um, my abuse and really cried. It was almost like lifting a burden off me. And I, when I went home, I didn't know, I didn't understand about the whole death life process. Because if I knew then, in fact, that I did learn later. So I was there when my other grandmother transitioned. I was right there when she took her last breath. But when I went home after my father's mother uh, transitioned and went to, I went to sleep and I was awakened. I mean, it was almost like somebody tapped me and I lived alone. It was her spirit. And I knew I was like, oh, wow, she's gone. Like, so that when, by the time my father called me to tell me, I, I when he called, he's like, hey, I said, I already know. And he said, how did you know? And I said, I... I can't explain it. She was just, she was here. Like I felt her presence. And that was in 2001. I was 32 at that point. And I just then, I, I went on this like search for, I was like on a quest, a deep spiritual quest. And it led me, like I got the Tibetan book of living and dying. I just, I don't know why I was led to Dharma books. Like I remember this is when Borders bookstore was around when there were bookstores, you know? And I remember just like, being like getting, I got gift cards for the holidays at that point, and I got all these books, and I was just like, oh, and I, I just wanted to do some form of meditation, but didn't know where or how, and definitely didn't have any money because I was trying to make a film. So, and what year is this about? This is the one in oh one December of oh one going into January oh oh two two thousand two, and um, was searching, just really searching, and then. Uh, a friend, um, a white male friend told me that he did this thing for 10 days. He was like, I, yeah, I did this powerful thing for 10 days in Barcelona, Spain. And I said, what is it? And he said, Vipassana meditation. And when he told me, I was like, oh my God. And I said, it's probably a lot of money. And he said, actually, no, you, you, it's not, it doesn't cost anything. It's on donation only. And so then I was like, oh my God, I got to do it. And so then I went online and, you know, read about it. And then I was like, what if it's a cult? Oh my God. So then I made a list of all my kind of new age, you know, quirky, magical black women friends. um, And and just to kind of say, hey, I'm thinking about this. Has anyone done it? And about three of them had. And I knew that they weren't, you know, at least from my vantage point, often some, you know, I was like, well, they they seem like they're pretty functioning. (laughs) Like they're not going to be, you know, kidnapped. So that was like, the thing is free. So then I applied and I sat my first, Vipassana meditation course in December 02, 2002 in the Esangueca tradition. I love this journey. I love this journey because this is where I think we met. You were already in this practice or beginning this practice. You were somewhere in the practice. For those who are listening who are not familiar with Vipassana, will you explain what it is? Because I want to, this, this is a rich story and your relationship to it is rich. But before we I, we dive into my questions about it, I want to contextualize it so folks who have no idea can right. kind of wrap their mind around it. So Vipassana meditation, it comes, um, was taught by the Buddha and it, it, and, and it's, 
Um, it comes from, you know, Vipassana means insight. It means to see things as they are. Um, and at the time that I took the course, I thought that Essen Gwenka was the only, in that tradition was, he was the only person that taught Vipassana. I didn't understand that Vipassana meditation is, 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 it's like saying, you know, you go to one Catholic church and you think that this is the only Catholic church on planet. Like I didn't know other people practice Vipassana, but in this tradition and in, in the Essen Gwenka, tradition you the minimum you can take it uh in order to learn it in this tradition you have to take a 10-day course and over the the period of 10 days you learn the technique and it's a very rigorous austere i mean for me i loved it you i feel like you either love it like it or you don't <laughs> um i love that like a moth to flame I mean, it's 12 hours of meditation starting at 4.30 in the morning to 9.30 at night. I mean, you, you, and you, you get breakfast and you have lunch. Um, and if you're a new student, meaning you've sat a course or if you're diabetic or pregnant, you, get a, you, can, you can have a light evening meal. But I tried not to eat after noon. There's no food after noon. So, you, you know, it's like you have breakfast at 6.30, then you have lunch between 11 and 12. And then that's it. Unless, you know, you're like, look, I can't, I can't make it like that. Um, and, and, and it's completely silent, no reading, no writing, no talking, unless you're talking to the teacher or you have a question with the managers in terms of, you know, support for, and, and, you know, like if you have the stomach ache or something like that. So it is, it's intense. And no they, eye contact. So, no. Oh, thank you. Yeah. No eye contact, no body contact. No, you're just kind of eyes downcast and you're, you're focusing within. You're just really observing the sensations throughout your body. And you're taught how to do it so it's not just some abstract thing. Starting with the breath, with uh, anapana meditation and then moving into observing bodily sensations. And it's really the body as a roadmap so that you are aware of impermanence, of the Nietzsche, of the constant changing that everything is impermanent. And so that you try to, even when you observe the pain, and you know, from sitting for long periods of time, that you begin to observe and understand that it's all vibrations. That doesn't mean, you know, like suffer forever, but just you just start recognizing um, that we're all, all of us are just, <laughs> as Gwenka says, a, a, a mass of subatomical particles. <laughs> I just think about that. As somebody, I mean, you know, I practiced for 17 years and sat 10 days and 20 day and 30 day courses. So in this tradition, I love this because when I, I think either you or sister friend, Krista Bell, you two are the two black women who introduced me to Vipassana and similar to what you're naming as your friends. I was like, well, if Aisha and Krista have done this, then it's got to be legit. Like it can't be (laughs) going and not talking for 10 days. And so I've done five 10 day courses myself, but, and Krista, I know has done 15 10 day courses. And then you have had this rich, deep, long history with it. And Vipassana really changed so much for me on my spiritual path and my life path. Like it just, I remember coming into courses. And I remember one, I had just had this like really horrible breakup and I was so angry. I was had so much like rage and anger from this relationship and how it ended and all this. And I just had to sit in that for 10 days until it changed. I couldn't, I couldn't distract. I couldn't numb out. I couldn't check out. I couldn't deflect. I couldn't, I just had to sit in it until it moved. And that's just like one example. And it did move. And then, and I got such deeper healing because I sat in it. And so I thank you for being a guide and a, like a permission to even, to even try it. Cause I wouldn't, and Krista kept telling me to do it to, for years. And I was like, when am I going to have 10 days to sit in silence? I have to, how am I going to clear my calendar? And then she was like, it'll make its way for you when it's time it will. And it did. So I would love to hear how it impacted you, how it informed you for those 17 years, and then how you transitioned out of it. Mm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I, you know, I, Vipassana in, in this taught in this tradition was a lifeline and an anchor. Um, it, in 1994, in a Tony K. Bombard script writing course, when I was working on my film, Know the Rape Documentary, she told me, 
do not come to my class empty handed because um, I kept saying, oh, I'm doing this film. She said, well, what does it look like? And so I wrote this choreo poem called A Stage of A State of Rage. And at the end, or throughout it, I go, this is a healing piece and it's spelled P-E-A-C-E. And then at the end, though, I go rage, meditation, action, healing, ashe. So I wrote that in 1994. In 2002 is when I took the, my first course. And I really feel like in many ways I was like speaking into existence because it's like this work around rage, right? And um, the, and then meditation and then in terms of, and then taking action, you know? Um, and I, I've just, it, it was, I, I'm still, I think I'm, I'm, I'm pulling back all the layers because I have so much, so many feelings about it now that I wouldn't have had it had you interviewed me. I would have been like, oh, you know, <laughs> a few years ago. And now I'm not in that space. But I will say that I can't even imagine who or where where I would be without it. I know, for instance, um, my my work, my love with accountability work, which comes out of my demanding accountability from my parents because my parents didn't, I told my parents what was happening when I was a child and they did not remove me from the situation. Um, and so, it, and I even, I saved my grandfather's life and I would do it again. Let me be really clear, but it's just kind of like, what does it mean to, to save the person's life who also was your ter- your sexual terrorist? But then he was also the same person who selflessly took care of his wife, my grandmother, for 10 years while she had Alzheimer's. She never set foot in a hospital or a nursing home. So it's all so complicated. And I feel like the Pashna was very I- instrumental with, with, with that journey. And so love with accountability really came up. I remember in 2015. So I've been working on violence against women issues since 1994. I've been talking about rape and sexual violence, but I hadn't really dealt came fully with my child sexual abuse, childhood sexual abuse. And when I started really demanding um, accountability, love with accountability started coming up in my emails and texts to my parents. And that that emerged from the meditation cushion. I re- just remember sitting in my cushion, just feeling like I was going to lose my effing mind because I was just so angry um, because my parents are these incredible human rights activists and do amazing work and are featured in, in my film, but just do work independent of me. And then I was like, and yet we're not talking about this great human rights atrocity in our family. So the rage, and at that point, they weren't getting it. They weren't seeing it. They weren't engaging with me and they're divorced. And so I had to just like sit on the cushion. And I just remember times being in my room at my apartment and just like on the cushion, it just like falling out, <laughs> literally just falling out like, ah, and just like, but still like sitting with, sitting with it. And just, I remember love with accountability, like coming to me, just literally coming to me. So for me, it, it's been salvation. It's been an anchor. It's, um, and I or I was a part of the organizing committee that organized the first African heritage course in held in India. Um, um, so people from all people of African descent, I mean, no, no course can see you, there's never like an only. So there wasn't African heritage only course, but it was a lot of folks from the continent of Africa, from um, the U.S., Caribbean and U.K. It was just really, really um, powerful um, experience. So. I mean, Vipassana was my life in so many ways as much as anything else was. I think for me, what what happened was that I, you know, they always say don't confuse the finger for the moon. And I, I think that that's what happened. I I made Vipassana the moon and, and it really was the finger. Wow. Will you say more about that? Will you, how did you do that? Yeah, um, well... I'll just say, you know, I, I left the tradition in 2019. So, um, which was my 50th year. 50 was a big year for me. Um, and it was very hard. It, I mean, I'd been struggling a lot. So as powerful as I think that this technique is, it is very powerful. Um, one of my main critiques is a lack of diversity. And it kind of sounds strange because the founder was an Indian man. He's now an ancestor. Um, and I mean, going to India was very profound and powerful and important for me because 
a teacher of mine at the time, black woman, the first and only at that time, black woman teacher in that tradition was just like, you need to go to India because Buddha wasn't from New England. Buddha is not white Anglo-Saxon Protestant or Jewish. You need to go to India. And so I'm really glad that I went to India and I mean, for, for you know, the African heritage course, but also just to be there in, in the land, you know, just to be with black skinned and brown skinned people and to, and to also understand that meditation isn't something that you do over there. It's a part of life. So, you know, here in the U S and, um, you know, the centers are, it's just silent. You know, just nothing. If you know, if you hear hair drop, you're like, what's going on? I can't concentrate <laughs> there. I mean, there were weddings, not necessarily at the centers, but the centers were in community. So there was just so much noise going on and you had to just learn how to be silent. I mean, you know, and it was just really powerful. And the Indians were, you know, the, just in terms of in, 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 engaging it. I mean, not in terms of in the hall, that respectful, all that, but there was just a different kind of warmth and and, you know, it was just kind of something what I how I know and experience people of color from around the world to be. So I'm really grateful. So I want to say that in terms of a North American and um, context um, and European context, the leadership is predominantly white or I mean, it, yeah, it's just overwhelmingly white. There's it's very strict in terms of how, first of all, becoming a teacher in this tradition is very subjective. I mean, in terms of, you know, first of all, you have to meet criteria, but even when you meet the criteria, and that means you have to have sat at least a 30 day course. But yet, before you can get there, you got to do five, 10 day courses. This is a lot of work, and I get it. Like, so it's no, no foul there, but it's just obviously it gets it's hard for people if you have to figure out how you're gonna if you're not a teacher or an independent or you know how do you get off this time for work to do all the courses, um, but there's really um, resistance around um, you know you're not you're not in terms of being a teacher if you want to be a teacher not in terms of being a practitioner um, activism social justice activism is frowned upon. Um, you know even the notion even us having the African Heritage course was frowned upon, um, any kind of discussions, um, around racial diversity is frowned upon. And so what I realized was that I really compartmentalized my life. So I would go to the Pashna, I would have, and I would sit and serve court and it would be profound. And I had dear friends who were in the tradition. Some have left, some are still there. And then I had my life, my social justice activist life, my black feminist queer life, all of that. And in many ways, never the two sh met. Um, I separated those two lives. But yet, the passion of the whole practice influenced my work and everything. So it was just this interesting thing. And so I also, then I did not, and then we're not allowed, once you go deeper in the tradition, now if you just take 10-day courses like what you did or doing, you know, it's very that's fine. It's fine for in terms of then you can like go to sit a course at Spirit Rock or go do some chanting or go practice Condomble. They're not going to do any, you know, there's no issue about that. But once you start taking longer courses, you really, you can't sit outside the tradition. Hmm. So I, I, and I, and now this is voluntarily, but I didn't, so I never sat in other traditions. So I didn't even understand that at Spirit Rock and Insight Meditation Center, that they too taught Vipassana. They didn't teach it the way Goenka taught it, but they too taught it. I would secretly and not tell you, like, I would go and hear talks like from Gina Sharp, from Ruth King, from Zenju Erklin Manuel. Like I went out to the San Francisco Zen Center to meet with Zenju. And, you know, so I would have these relationships in, in directly or indirectly, Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams through their writings and stuff. But it was nothing that I ever felt like I could share or talk about privately um, in, in, in the context of Vipassana as taught by Goenka. And so I think that what happened for me was that and, and and I made peace with it because I was just like, this is the only path. This is the path for me and I'm going all the way. And so I I felt like I couldn't continue without going up. So then over time, kind of connecting with other folks, particularly black Dharma practitioners, I really credit my sibling and friend and, and mentor teacher, Dr. Shante Smalls. Um, and then, you know, J Dr. Yasmin Sayudella, Savannah Shange, Dr. Shange. So like just all of like just connecting in the internet and seeing, I was like, wait, there's another world out here of, of Dharma practitioners, uh, 
a, a sister friend, Rebecca Johnson, black uh, lesbian woman was just like, there are other people who practice Theravada, you know, Buddhism. This is, you don't have, this isn't the only place. And so I just realized like I had come to the end of the road, like that they, there was, there is no express commitment to diversity. There is no express commitment to putting black, BIPOC, black indigenous people of color who are domestic to the U.S. on the Dhamma seat. Um, so I just was like, I, I can no longer be a part of this. And it was hard. It was hard. It was a hard, painful decision. But I got to tell you, I just feel like, you know, Sealy and the color purple at the end. Like, I just feel like I'm running in a field, uh, you know, a wide open field, like that I am now embracing a an interpretation of the Dharma that is more expansive. And, you know, and I, and I credit my sibling, like uh, Kishan Sipal, Sonia Ebron, Louisa Kitab, like just BIPOC siblings who are in that tradition. Another very dear friend, Chris Coella, um, you know, just in terms of being able to have these conversations. Um, and all of us have, have left. I mean, and we were all deep in it, very deep. I mean, it was powerful. We all are clear. It was powerful, and it, but it was just like it, it was, it was too restrictive. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for taking us on that journey because it's, I do hear that depth of devotion, that depth of practice and all of these things that you got out of it. And then you got to the point where you realized, oh no, I need more. Like this isn't all I need more. And I want to be my whole self wherever I go. This is, it's like such permission and such liberation, especially for folks who are listening, who may not be in the Buddhist tradition or the Vipassana tradition, but maybe in their church or maybe in their community, or there may be where they feel like they have to be compartmentalized or fragmented to be seen, or which then that means they're not being seen, right? So I, I just thank you so much for naming that. How, so how do you then hold all of these now in 2021 how do you hold all of these pieces of you? Yeah, well, when I, I, I left Vipassana as taught by Goenka um, in September of 2019, September 17th. And like, I think October 10th, I went to Spirit Rock Meditation Center in the Bay Area for something called the Gathering 2, which was a gathering for African descent, Black Buddhist practitioners, Buddhist travelers. And so it was a whole week for the TJ had, they brought in 70 teachers, black teachers from all over the U S and in, in the UK. And I believe in, in from Australia, New Zealand, Brazil. And then it was open to the broader Sangha on Saturday and Sunday. So it was 300 of us. And to, I mean, when I got there and I had never been to spirit rock. Right. And so, and I go to the Bay area a lot, like that's just how close, I mean, I was so close, it, but I was just like, no, I can't. Cause I'm in this tradition. When I got there, it was like on the dais when on the opening was like black women drumming, like next to Buddha, next to, you know, just all, candles, flowers. I mean, I cried. It felt, even though it wasn't about me, like that gathering, I just felt like the universe was like, come, come, come. Like, it was like, I'd left this container going, who, who am I? Who will I be? Where will I be? Oh my God, my whole life, my whole like, spiritual identity. And, you know, I'm so grateful to Shantae for telling me about it. And I, and my cousin, I, my, um, my cousin had a milestone birthday that year and she's also, um, she's a Libra. So it was, I treated her to the gathering. So I shared, she's my first cousin. We shared that experience and she's not a Buddhist practitioner, but she was really interested. So it was really powerful to share that with her. And then since then, like I have, I'm, I'm studying with uh, Tereri Sala, who is a Black woman Dharma practitioner and guiding teacher of Seattle Insight Meditation Center, and Gina Sharp, who is someone who I've known for about and followed for 10, 11 years. And it was just, and so to re, be able to connect with her now, because there was an opportunity for me to work with her years ago, but I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm in the Goenka tradition, so I can't do that, mm. but thank you. So now to work with her, um, and then as well as uh, Shantae, Dr. Shantae Smalls, um, that's, it's, it's really powerful. And now I'm in a, a two-year mindfulness meditation uh, teacher certifi certification program with Jack Kornfield and Tara Brock, 
And then in it, there's we have these cohorts. So I'm in an all black woman cohort of six practitioners and one teacher who's a black woman, Conda Mason. So I just feel like I just I just want to like jump for joy. And 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 I went now, let me be clear. I was in I was so I was like spitting mad. Like, what was I doing for 17 years? It was a waste of my time, blah, blah, you know. And so grateful for Tureri and Shante and Gina. They're like, no, no, no. It's part of the journey. It's part of the journey. And like, and helping me to see like how much I received from that practice, the depth of the practice, I mean, to be able to sit for 30 days and met, like that I really learned, I received a lot from it and it was time to go. So I don't have to like curse out the darkness <laughs> or curse out the light, you know, like it's just like, or throw the baby out with the ba- bath with all these violent terms, like that I can embrace that and just be like, and now I'm in a new space. So that is still foundational. And I still, I will view Goinka as one of my teachers without question. I mean, yeah, definitely. But it's just like, and I've moved on. Oh, I love it. I love it. So let's backtrack a little bit. Let's backtrack. You mentioned it, but, but we didn't really talk about it. Your masterpiece, No, the Rape Documentary. This is where we met. This is, this is how you and I connected at Spelman College. You had brought it to, to premiere. You were showing it or speaking or something at the Women's mm-hmm. Center, the beloved Women's Center where I got my Bachelor's of Arts, and um, which like saved my sanity and my life, Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal and Dr. Imbahati yeah. Kaumba, and where I learned about feminism, Black fem- feminism, and Tony K. Bombara. Like all of these, these and Audre Lorde, all of these ancestors and elders that you're naming the Women's Center like brought them to me and they brought you to me. So I and your brilliant masterpiece. So for those who are listening, who are not familiar with No, the rape documentary, can you tell us about mm. it and and how it came to be? You, you mentioned it a little bit, but I want to yeah. hear more. Yeah. So I started making a film called for a while, the rape video project that turned into know the rape documentary. I started it in 1994. It was a 12 year journey, seven of which were full time. I can't imagine making it without the support of Spelman College. I mean, there's so many who supported the film. I want to be clear, but Spelman, um, Dr. Janetta Cole, I mean, um, as as well as Beverly Guy Sheptaw and, and Bahati, the Women's Center. I mean, I filmed a lot of no in the Women's Center. Um, and then I w- I had an artist in residency with um, uh, Ayoka Chinzera, filmmaker, um, when I was doing some of the post production work. And it was through there, just in terms of another connection, that I met and worked with and became friends with Tiana McCladen. Oh. So it was just like all of these kind of yes, yeah, Spellman just really powerful. But back to No, it's um, uh, a feature length film that looks at, um, that breaks the silence around sexual violence um, committed against uh, Black women. And and, I mean, I would say committed against Black women by Black men and boys, but I really want to be very clear. It's committed against cisgender Black women and girls by um, cisgender Black men. Um, The film moves from enslavement uh, through present day and present day then was <laughs> 2000, the early 2000s. Um, and it's, it is song. I mean, it, it's, it's testimony survive centering survivor testimonies. It's, um, dance, it's poetry and music. And for like, to me, it's like, there's so many now like iconic figures. I mean, of course, you know, Janetta and Beverly and Farrah, Jasmine Griffin and Loretta Ross, my mother, Gwendolyn Zahar Simmons and Tracy West. I mean, and poets, Essex Hemphill, Samia Bashir, Honoré Jeffers. It was just, it was really an incredible journey. Almost all black women. I mean, the, the editor Sharon Mullally is a white woman, white feminist lesbian. The composer Jascar Xavier, who is Tamara Xavier, the co-producer and director of choreography, her brother. And it was a labor of love, a labor of commitment. I mean, it took. And when I say it took everything, that it, it took me to hell and back, and hell and back. But it also took me around the world in terms of having sc- educational fundraising screenings throughout Europe and France and in England and Italy. I'm um, having, com- and, and in France and in Italy, 
uh, sisters and siblings were simultaneously translating the work in progress of so the film would be playing and they would be translating it in Italian and French and screening it with um, Algerian communities, um, with um, Arab, um, Arab, other Arab communities, but Algerian has such a specific identity in France in terms of the history with the, the how they ended colonialism, but also and in West African and Caribbean. And then my father's in... Um, based in Eastern Europe. And so just doing a lot of work with Roma Sinti communities and really just really making connections around what does it mean to be in a marginalized community and, and, and be a, um, a rape in that community. And then how do you deal with it when your community is under siege? So it was really, really an intense experience. Um, and it came out in 06 and it's still, I mean, you know, there's some things dated because like the climax is the Mike Tyson rape trial. And now like Mike Tyson's all warm and cuddly. And I believe in redemption and I believe in all of that. Like, I, I definitely believe that. So I don't want to like, because you've caused harm at one point, you don't, you know, that you, therefore you're a horrible person. I don't believe in that. I just don't recall any accountability on his part. I mean, I know he had the, he did time and I'm definitely a prison abolitionist. So, but I say that to say that I know that there, there's a generation of folks who don't even know, um, about what happened and, and not so much in terms, I mean, there's the rape, which was horrible committed against Desiree Washington, but then how the community specifically black male and female religious leaders from the nation of Islam to the national Baptist convention really through uh, Desiree Washington through the wall to the wolves. And so really just talking about that and ultimately ending on healing, um, healing and accountability outside of the carceral system. So I wasn't using language like restorative or transformative justice. I, I didn't even understand that. But what I did know was that prison wasn't going to stop rape and really did a lot of work to convey that message um, in the film and talk about how religion has been used as a weapon, but how it's also been used as a bomb um, for survivors. And I focused at that time on the two big monotheistic um, religions, Christianity and Islam. If I were making it now, I know I would include some Buddhism and some Santeria and Ipa and Kundamble. Like I know I would, but there I was just focused on Christianity and Islam. I love it. I love it. Why was it, and you've talked here today about your childhood sexual assault and being sexually assaulted, raped as a, an adult. Why was this the film that you wanted to make? Why was this important? Yes. I had the opportunity to be an election observer of the elections in 1994 in the Republic of South Africa, where Mandela became the first, uh, where well, he be was elected president in the first free and fair, um, quote unquote, elections. And while I was there, so I was 25, I turned 25 in South Africa. And um, I was the youngest member of a delegation from the American Friends Service Committee. And when I was there, and I was there for six weeks. I met with black women, black and um, Indian um, women in colored, so-called colored in terms of their, their terminology, women activists. And I have this sign and it says one of the most violent social settings in South Africa is the home, um, the crime battering. And they gave that to me because here we were celebrating and rejoicing the end of legalized apartheid. And I was very involved in the anti-apartheid movement as a high school student. And, you know, my father was a director of, of, of South Africa programs at American Friends Service Committee. So it was just, there was just, I, I grew up very politicized families. So to be there and to get celebrating the end of racialized apartheid and to be engaged in conversations with women around the fear of sexual violence. And that was on the heels, like that was right at, I mean, Tice, the Tyson trial and um, the Clarence Thomas hearings when Anita Hill was subpoenaed to have to testify about the sexual harassment that she experienced at here with Clarence Thomas. I was just like, oh, uh, racism is not going to set us free. Racism needs to end. It must end. But racism alone will not set us free. And so that that's where it started. And so then in fall of 1994, myself and Tamara Xavier, we had our first pre-production meeting around No, the Rape Documentary. And then I took, as I did so many courses with Tony, um, a script writing course, and that's where I wrote A State of Rage. So it all kind of comes full circle. So for me, it was really wanting to break the silence 
about sexual violence in black communities and um, really wanting to put on screen what at that time, you know, and Tazaki Shange and Alice Walker and Michelle Wallace and many others, June Jordan had put on paper. Like it was just really wanting to create this um, praise song um, in terms of our um, in, 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 a praise song in response to the trauma. And so, and I'm really, and you know, it took a long time because I didn't get a lot of funding. HBO turned me down, PBS. I, I mean, I, I got like, commentary like you know let's face it most people in middle america don't care about the rape of black women and girls what's your axe to grind given that you're a lesbian um the moral point of view in the black community is that a man shouldn't be in a woman's room at 2 a.m a woman shouldn't be in a man's room at 2 a.m in the morning so these are like letters that i have right now <laughs> that people <laughs> have said um, wrote. I mean, they could not do that now, right? Because you could screenshot it and all that, but this is in the 90s. And so for me, it was just really like, I'm going to, I want to break the silence ar- around this. Um, and and so that long journey meant initially it was just going to be Black women, but then it was like, oh no, I, I have to include the voices of Black men, like Black men who are doing the work to end violence against women. And then I was just only going to focus contemporarily. And it was like, oh no, we've got to look at this historically. So I talk about enslavement, middle passage, you know, um, lynching and how black women are at the forefront of the anti-lynching movement because Clarence Thomas said, this is a high tech lynching, you know, looking at the civil rights and black power movement with Elaine Brown and and my mother in terms of talking about sexual assault there and how they responded to it. So all of this, and then homophobia, all, all of this while along highlighting um, women's testimonies of, of betrayal and harm by lovers, by leaders in revolutionary movements, by uh, academic professionals, all and really challenging this myth about who the harm doers are. Now, now that's not so kind of radical as, as it was then. Now we know that movie stars, right? You know, we have an understanding and all of that. But at the time that I was doing it, these were like, particularly because of racism, sacred cows, you don't talk about black male leadership, you know, when they're fighting for racial justice or the first black at the university, or you don't talk about that stuff because, you know, we have to deal with racism. And so for me, I was like, we're going to break it. And that's still... I think the dominant tone, even if it's not explicitly said, it's still inferred, insinuated, and that's how people respond. So if someone, particularly a Black woman or femme, is listening to this conversation right now and is a survivor of sexual assault, of rape, of something that was harmful to her, but is couched in this culture of silence and shame, of not feeling safe, breaking the silence like you just named, even, you know, even with all of this beautiful example and Audre Lorde saying your silence will not protect you, many of us don't know how to speak up. So what would you want her to know? What would you want to tell her? No, and it's so interesting that you asked that question because, you know, your silence won't protect you. And sometimes even speaking doesn't. And I say that as the 10 year old Aisha who told her parents what was happening and they didn't remove me from the situation. So what I would want her to know is regardless of what, if, if, if someone is saying, if shaming, blaming you, it is not your fault. I don't care. I don't care what's going on. (laughs) There's no situation where invasion of your body is your fault. Like, I don't, I don't care if you give a mixed message. I don't care. I don't care if you're a sex worker. I don't care. You know, that that's where I come from, like, really. And that's what I would really want her to know. And I would want her to know that, you know, keep searching to find somebody to talk. Like, if the first person is like, is your fault, the second person is your, it's bullshit. That, I mean, that's really what I want to, you know, just say that it is not your fault. You, there is an anything you can do that can excuse, condone, justify any form of violence against your body, any, any, nothing. And I think that that's where we need to get to. We don't need to know the circum. We don't need to know not for somebody violating in, in, as I mean, I learned that term from uh, Gloria Steinem invading our bodies against our will like that. No, you know, I think that that's really, really key. And hopefully to be able to 
I mean, find resources. I mean, thankfully, we're in a different era now because of internet. There's, I mean, there's a lot of horrible stuff out there, but there, there are spaces and places where um, folks um, can go. And I, I mean, I, I received a big grant to subtitle the film and um, also a study guide, which is downloadable. So on, on my uh, Know the Rape documentary website. And so like, so all those, like there's a lot of resources now that I'm sure some of them are dated because the study guide came out um, a while ago, but the websites, a lot of them are not. And then point to other resources. And as well as on my Love with Accountability um, website, there's also um, a lot of resources, organizations, as well as books and media in terms of that really are affirming to survivors and um, specifically um, Black survivors. That, that, that's really my goal. I mean, I want all survivors to be safe. I want all survivors to heal. And I start with the community from which I come from in this lifetime, and that's Black people. Yeah, absolutely. I really, really appreciate that because... And I will include links to all of that in the show notes for those of you who are listening who are trying to figure out where you can find this. I will include all the links. Um, and I love the trajectory of, the, of this journey, right? That you started with No, the rape documentary, and now it's Love with Accountability. Because I think what is often so disruptive is that people want to race to accountability. or the, No, they want to race to love without accountability. And they don't even want to name what happened. They're just like, let's fix this. Let's smooth this over. Let's just pretend like nothing happened here. All is well. I love you. You love me. Let's be happy. And it's like, there's some things that are missing to actually have accountability, to actually have love and safety. There has to be accountability and we have to name what's true. And so you've left these these beautiful testimonies of what that looks like, what that can look like for the world to really understand. So that's not about pretending that something didn't, that harm wasn't caused. It's you have to name it in order to heal it. You do, you do have to name it. And I also, I don't, I don't, and I don't push forgiveness, like particularly forgiveness without an apology or account, like it's okay. Like I, I don't, I don't even push that either. And I think that, you know, you take your, pro, you know, and, and that it is a process. Like I'm, I'm what, 26, 27 years in of doing this work and I still have rage. I still have rage. And I, and I think in the past, oh, that's something that I would say in terms of the Pashna as taught by Gwenka. I, I realized that I was trying to bypass the rage. Like I was thinking, oh, I'm, I'm done with that because I wanted to be done with that because that I needed to be able to prove that I'm equanimous with everything. No, I'm still fucking angry and I have a right to be angry. Now, what I do with that anger is, is, is something else. But I just think to be able to be like, oh no, there's still rage there and there's nothing wrong. Like there's some horrors that happened and I'm, I'm working through that. So I don't, we don't have to bypass our, our rage. We don't have to bypass it to, and to still be on the healing journey. Like it, it's not like an either or it's both. And Ooh, I love it. I love it so much, especially because as black women, particularly black American women, multi-generational descendants of enslaved and free African people, we have this stigma of being the angry Black woman. And I think some people are like, I don't want to be that, so I'm just going to pretend like I have no anger. I'm going to pretend like I have no rage. I'm just going to like be what sweet and accommodating and whatever, right? And so for you to name that you can have rage and still be on your spiritual path is liberation because you have to honor your whole human emotions. Like they're, they're, none of them are wrong or bad. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I think that we have, a, we have a right to that. And so often we're trying not to be or because you meditate, you don't have anger. It's like, no, no, I think it's, I, I meditate so that I don't, my anger doesn't make me cause any harm. <laughs> Hopefully to myself and definitely not to other people. I think that that's what it's about. That's what, I mean, so more and more I understand, like, because I used to think rage, meditation, action, healing, my mantra at the of my poem, and it's the end of the the no song at the the closing dance sequence, I used to think that that meant, oh, no more anger. And perhaps I'll, maybe I'll get there. Maybe I won't. But it was just like, no, it's just kind of like how, allowing meditation for me, helping me to move from reaction to taking action with discernment. But it doesn't mean not being angry. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Aisha, for this conversation. I appreciate and love you so much. For folks who want to find you out on the internet somewhere, where's the best way to catch up and connect with you? 
Yeah, um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at AfroLez. I think that's the best way. And then you can find me also on Facebook at Aisha Shahida Simmons, uh, culture worker. Um, so that's my public page, Aisha Shahida Simmons, culture worker. And then um, Twitter and Instagram, AfroLez, A-F-R-O-L-E-Z. And then th- both those places will lead you elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. So much love and appreciation to you always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is amazing. Such a gift. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being part of the Black Girl Mystic podcast portal. It's been an honor to have you in this sacred space. If you enjoyed yourself, Be sure to subscribe, review, and leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Your support helps other mystics just like you find our portal and community. Speaking of, if you'd like to stay connected and go even deeper, find me over on Instagram and say hi at Laren Alta, L-E-R-I-N-A-L-T-A. That's L-E-R-I-N-A-L-T-A. And so for now, we close this beautiful portal until we decide to meet again. Thank you so much for being here. So much love. Signing off. Oh, today, today.